Hello. In the previous lecture, we were discussing uh, Laplace's equation in one dimension. In this lecture, we are going to study Laplace's equation in two dimensions. Okay. Uh, mostly the results will remain the same. However, I'm going to rediscuss all those results, like the averaging property. I'm going to rediscuss, and also I'm going to rediscuss the uh, how to find. Uh, so, so this is what uh, and second thing that we are going to discuss that v x y like in the one dimension also we saw that vxy does not tolerate any local maximum or minimum the same way we are going to do the uh, almost similar analogous results we will find in the laplace's equation in two dimensions also so we've done till now the laplace's equation in one dimension here is the case of laplace's equation in two dimensions so this is just an introductory exposition uh, don't worry about we'll do things in greater detail in two dimensions so here we are just uh, focusing on the Qualitative result. So in two dimension, for simpler case, if I use the Cartesian coordinate, I can write my del square v upon del x square plus del square v upon del y square equal to zero. So this is the Laplace's equation in two dimension, and one can readily verify that uh, one of the solution can be v x y is equals to a square by two x square minus y square. This you can see by one of the methods called as method of separation of variables. You know that this particular function is it will deal only v as a function of x and not deal v as a function of y. And here you can see that this is a function of y, and uh, here it, v will be dealt as a function of y, and x will be taken as a constant. So you can expect some x coming out from here and some y coming out from here as a constant. And overall, in order that their sum becomes zero, what we do, we actually equate them to some constant. So we do this kind of stuff. Uh, this is called as method of separation of variables. We'll discuss all these things in greater detail. But uh, while we are doing, like, let's say this is a square, and we replace this as minus of a square. So this is what we do, and from here we'll get that v square is a square x square minus a square by two y square. This is what we're going to get, and this you can verify by placing this particular uh, v in inside this particular Laplace's equation as well. Uh, Further, if I just say that uh, what will be, will this be a solution or not? So this will also form a solution. This particular thing will also form a solution. You can verify to yourself that your del, del B by del X will be equals to one upon X square plus Y square twice X. And then if you do del square V upon del X square, del X square, you will get, I think, X square plus Y square whole squared. And then you will have a, a minus, I think this would be minus 2x square plus 2 divided by, I think, x square plus y square. So you you uh, you can clearly see that, uh, I think, it, is there a mistake? Minus 1 upon x square plus y square, this will become twice x, and then you will just differentiate x, so this will be 2. So overall, this will become 1, and uh, ah, this will be, I think, 4x square, sorry, my mistake. So this will be I think four x square because two is already there. So overall you will find, <coughs> sorry, overall you will find that uh, overall if I take a common out, so I'll get x square plus y square. I can take two also common out. So I will get simply minus two x square. From here you will get y square plus x square. And overall you will get this as so del square v upon del x square. So del square v upon del x square, you will get as 2 y square minus x square upon x square plus y square whole square. And if I find del square y, v upon del y square, you'll get 2 times x square minus y square upon x square plus y square whole square. So overall, if you add them up, you'll find that your del square v is equal to 0. So clearly, this is also solution. So I told you very, very early also, that Laplace's equation may have uh, will have some infinitely uh, some non-unique solution. So Laplace's equation will have non-unique solution, and these non-unique solution once your initial boundary conditions are specified, we can obtain a unique solution, which is more important. Uh, unique solution to a solution to the Laplace's equation is known. Laplace's equation is known once boundary conditions are specified. Once boundary condition are specified. So once your boundary conditions are specified, then you will be able to understand what will be the uh, what what is that unique solution to that particular Laplace's equation in that particular physical setting. 
okay uh, so <clears throat> let us <clears throat> let us uh, draw our attention to uh, let us draw our attention to one of the analogous result from that uh, one of the analogous result uh, that we would write that is quite analogous to one that we written for one dimension the first thing is we knew that in one dimension we wrote that our potential uh, can be written as average a potential at a point x can be written as an average of the uh, average of the potential which is similarly situated uh, which are almost symmetrically situated from that particular point x so average of so this particular theorem here also will obey will, will here also we'll see the adherence to this particular uh, this particular result but slightly differently now one thing that you should remember that if you are, if i have to average my function with respect to a variable let's say z what is the way so, uh, let's say x so let's say if i have to average my function with respect to variable x i have to just integrate it and this is uh, this is if my function is riemann integrable and if i want to find the average value of my function average value of my function averaged with respect to variable x then this will be my average value okay now in two dimension we certainly would need some diff different other things so for example if i have my uh, v as a function of x y here and if i want to find the value of this v x y all i need to do is i have to move around in a circle i will find the potential as a, uh, a average value of the potential over the circumference and divided by circumference so in order to find in order to find uh, v at a point x comma y x comma y uh, one needs to average one needs to average potential around this point potential around this point and the best way is to uh, around this point the best way would be to to just go equidistant let's say it is at a distance r radial distance r all i need is i have to integrate bdn over this entire circumference divided by integration d so i can say this will be my sorry this will be my vx y so in general in two dimension the 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 statement that we wrote for one dimension also is the same is is like in one dimension we wrote that my vx was half of vx minus epsilon plus half of vx plus epsilon here i can write the same average property holds here also that is the average property averaging property holds here as well holds for potential v x y as well as well and we know that if i know my if i want to know my potential at x comma y if i want to know my potential at x comma y so what i will do v x comma y i can simply find it as integral v d n divided by integral d n here you can say that these points are let's say equidistant and let's say at a distance r so this will give you 1 upon 2 pi r and then you will have integration with you. so this is how you are going to find the potential at a point so you can just take an average of the potential around that particular point and you will find it so this is a similar result that we've done in our one dimension also second result is that vxy does not tolerate any local maximum or minimum vxy does not tolerate any local maximum or minimum the same result here also we'll write minimum or maximum and one must understand that all the if extreme values have to have have to have have to occur the extreme values if have to occur if they have to occur they will be on the bounds or you can say they will be on the boundaries let us understand this particular uh, concept by uh, slight mathematical uh, thing. Here, this particular thing you have to remember. This is an averaging property because this is, uh, this is kind kind of similar result uh, we have to develop. So in one dimension we had to move along the line. In two dimensions, since a point, since there is a point, and you can uh, you can write all these points to be a neighboring point. So therefore, this result will slightly vary. And uh, VXY does not tolerate any local maximum or minimum and extreme values if they occur, they will occur only on the boundaries. So how to understand this particular thing? So always know, always understand uh, 
if i have if i had a function of one variable then i have to simply differentiate it with respect to one variable now if i have a function of two variables what to do if i have instead function of two variables what to do so for two variables i'm just writing a result so that uh, it becomes easy for you okay so for two variables so to, for two variables let us understand one of the things so for two variables if i if for two variables if i say that my x not comma y not is a local maximum if i have a function of two variables fx y and if i say that fx not comma y not is a local minimum what does it imply it implies that fx y must be greater than equals to x not comma y not f of x not comma y not where x y are nothing but the neighboring points of x not comma y not so if this is my point x not comma y not and these are my neighboring points so these these are the points in a this cop radius of sal these points x comma y are are in the epsilon neighborhood of x not comma y not and if i say that my function is a local minimum then fx y must be greater than equal to f of x not comma y what does it imply it implies that if i take any neighborhood of if i take a local neighborhood of uh, x not comma y not that is if i take an epsilon neighborhood of x not comma y not in that particular neighborhood the minimum value will be fx not comma y not and all other points will be either will have either the value greater than fx not comma y not or equal to so it implies that there is a local minimum at x not comma y not similarly i can write my function will have a local maximum at point x not comma y not if fx y is less than equal to f of x not comma y not where x y are the points in a given neighborhood of x not comma y not. so if it, in a given local neighborhood of if given local neighborhood of x not comma y not if i am if i am in a position to write that fx y is always less than equal to f of x not comma y not then then what does it imply implies that x not comma y not is a local maximum and then there is another case which is called a saddle point where function is neither maximum nor minimum neither maximum nor minimum so there is a point there is a point called a saddle point in the uh, multivariate calculus there is a point called a saddle point where you may not expect to be with with where neither the point x not if i say that my point x not comma y not is a saddle point then what does it mean it means that in the neighborhood of x not comma y not i am not in a position to say that whether this is true or this is true so in this particular x not comma y not neighborhood both of them may be true Uh, so i am not in a position to say that whether it is a local maximum local minimum then i say that this is a saddle point and one of the ways to characterize this uh, characterize uh, this is when i have to find uh, one of the simple ways is a second derivative test so if my fx y uh, function uh, has a second order derivative defined second order partial partial derivative defined first order derivative defined and uh, like first order partial derivatives are continuous then how to determine how to determine uh, that my uh, fx y has a local maximum or minimum at x not comma y not and has a saddle point at x not comma y not it is fairly easy to see all we have to determine is this determinant which lately uh, lately in generalized in generalized ways called as hessian determinant so this is what we have to do we have to simply see f of, f of xx f of y by minus f of x y square now if this determinant d is greater than 0 if this determinant is greater than 0 and f x x at x not comma y not is greater than 0 then x not comma y not is a local minimum if this determinant is again greater than 0 and this particular f x x f x not comma y not is less than 0 then i will say that my x not comma y not is a local maximum and further if this determinant is negative then this part, at this particular point x the this particular point x not comma y not is a saddle point as an example i am giving you one of the example which is here itself illustrated so we know that for two dimension we just try to derive a simple 
uh, a simple uh, sort of solution. And a simple solution to this, although I have also told that ln of x squared plus y squared is also a solution. Probably if you uh, if you take the case of e g par x square minus y square, that may also be a solution. So b x five will have in may have infinitely many solutions. Uh, will have infinitely many solutions for this particular Laplace's equation. But one needs to understand that in a particular physical setting, there would be some extra uh, some conditions boundary conditions defined. And if those boundary conditions are defined, then we we will get some unique solution. But overall, just for the discussion, we are doing it. So first discussion that we've done that we have developed an analogous result from the one dimension. So one dimension suggested that b x is an average of of the potential nearby, and that we have de derived uh, that we have defined the, in this manner. And second, but second point I have just illustrated, I have just explained to you what are the conditions for local maximum and minimum and saddle point. Now this is something that you have to remember. This is something from your uh, multivariate calculus class. So probably if you had taken mathematics course and if you had this multivariate calculus uh, as a subject, then you might be knowing it. If you're not knowing it, I've just uh, listed all these important facts here. Now let us take the solution that we uh, like that we wrote for the two-dimensional uh, Laplace's equation. So one of the solution that I wrote was I think a square by two, and I wrote x square minus y square. This was the solution that I wrote. Okay, uh, and, and as you understand, as I understand, what I have to do, I have to simply first let us understand that whether this particular uh, particular function admit any local maximum. The first thing in order to find a local maximum minimum is to first find first evaluate the critical points. We have to first evaluate the critical point. Okay, how to evaluate critical point? Uh, in one dimension, we only had one derivative. Here, we will have two derivatives. So del b upon del x equal to zero, we have to do. And del b upon del y, we have to do zero. And this will yield us x equal to zero and y equal to zero. So clearly, origin is interior, is a is a critical point. Is a critical point. Okay. Now, uh, also understand that these are the critical points. Let us evaluate what sort of points these are. I mean, are they local maximum, local minimum? Our theory suggests that bx cannot have local maximum or minimum. Okay, our theory says that we can, bx cannot have a local maximum or minimum. Let us uh, find, uh, so what? In order to find that, first we have to find the determinant d, uh, which will be given by bxx at 0, 0, by at 0, 0, minus bxy at 0, 0. bxx at 0, 0 will be, I think, a square, v y y will be at the minus a square and then v x y would be zero so overall it will be like minus a key power four minus a key power four means this is negative and if it is negative what does it imply it imply that zero comma zero is a saddle point but in other words i can write it is neither minimum nor maximum so zero comma zero is neither minimum nor maximum so this is what we knew that the solution of the Laplace's equation in two dimension, that here in this case is the potential function, will not have any local or local maximum or local minimum. All the extreme values will be found on the boundaries, and these boundaries will be defined in the uh, will will be defined in the problem itself or in the physical context. You will be able to understand what sort of boundaries are we are we talking about. Uh, in other way, if you want to just uh, suggest that uh, whether zero comma zero can be a uh, can be a local minimum or local maximum let us see if we can reject it straight away so i'll reject it straight away by see if i just want to uh, just i'm just making a neighborhood of 0 comma 0 and just making a neighborhood of 0 comma 0 okay so in the del neighborhood so i'm just showing an exaggerated view so i'm taking a del neighborhood of 0 comma 0 so this is my del neighborhood of 0 comma 0 okay now what i would do i would select some points uh, Select some points on the x-axis which are in the neighborhood, which are contained in the neighborhood. So let us say I take some point like this, and let's say this is del by two comma zero, and I take this point zero comma del by two here. Okay. So if I take this point del by two comma zero, you can you can clearly see that this is inside the neighborhood of zero comma zero, and this will always lie. So however small del I make, however small del I make, del by two will always be contained inside this. A circle of radius depth, isn't it? So if I take this, what I will get the the potential function. Sorry, this is not negative. This is positive. This will be, I think, a square 
by 4 and then there will be del square by 4. So this is positive. It implies what? It implies if I go to the right, if I go to the right from 0, 0, I'm going to, my potential function is just going to become positive, positive, positive. That is on this axis, along this axis, I can write that my V, X, Y will always be greater than equal to V0. Is that clear? But if I move in this direction, so this is one. If I move in this direction, which also happens to be the neighborhood only. Like if I if I take a circle of radius del, which which I'm defining the neighborhood of point 0, 0, 0, comma del by 2 is also inside the neighborhood of del neighborhood of 0, 0, isn't it? So if I take this point 0, comma del by 2, so the potential function at 0, comma del by 2 will simply be minus of a square. Sorry, this is 2. Sorry, my mistake. This is not a square by 4, this is a square by 2. So minus a square by 2. And then there will be some del square by 4. In any case, this will be negative. So if I move in this direction, and so I will always, I will find that my Vx5 would be negative. Or in other words, I will say my Vx5 is always less than V0. So if I move in this direction, then I will say that my 0, 0, uh, 0, 0 is a local minimum. If I move in this direction, that is along y axis, I'll say that my 0, 0 is a local maximum. So I cannot identify with the whether it is a local maximum or minimum. So I'll say that at 0, 0, neither local maximum is there, nor local minimum is there. Technically, there is a saddle point. But overall, understand this particular thing, a square by 2, x square minus y square, happens to be the solution of the Laplace's equation. And this also sort of, I'm not giving you proof, but I'm just trying to relate with certain things that this does not tolerate any local maximum or minimum. Rather, if at all the extreme values occur, they will always occur on the boundaries. And these boundaries will be known from the physical context. And let us take one such physical context. And thus, one such physical context will be a coaxial cable, or you can say cylindrical capacitors. OK. Uh, so understand uh, this particular, uh, this particular uh, uh, like physical problem. Here you are given, here you are given a coaxial cable and this particular cable I'm uh, like drawing cylindrical, one of the cylindrical and since it is coaxial, so I'll make another cylinder. And this is infinitely extending along z-axis. So it is infinitely extending along z-axis. So it is infinitely extending along z-axis. Also, the inner conductor is maintained at the constant potential phi naught, which is positive. So inner conductor is maintained at the constant potential that is phi naught, and the outer conductor is grounded. The outer conductor is grounded. So eventually, this particular inner uh, side will develop some negative charges. Okay, so this will behave as a cylindrical capacitor. Uh, since you can see that uh, this particular problem has a spherical symmetry, so what I'll do, I'll simply take del square v is equal to zero, and you know there is uh, and there is no source of six, so del square v would be zero. And if I want to solve this thing, I will try to solve it in the, uh, I will try to solve it in the, I will try to solve it in the, um, what you can say, cylindrical polar coordinate system. So in cylindrical polar coordinate system, you have three coordinates, that is rho, phi, and z. And understand that this is infinitely extending from here to here. So from origin, if you can try it, you can clearly see that there's a symmetry. As much as we are going up, as much as we are going down, so there is a symmetry about z-axis. So I will write that there is a symmetry about z-axis. And since the charge is distributed uniformly, so there is no variation, no variation along, uh, along z-axis. There is no variation along z-axis. Further, you can see that these charges are actually distributed on the surface itself. So like you can see that these charges are distributed uniformly on the surfaces. So if they're distributed uniformly on the surfaces, if I take, uh, if I just move around with respect to phi, I will find equal sort of distribution. So I can say uh, that there's also, um, like there's a symmetry along phi, along phi, along phi. So only thing that, uh, that you, you can think is that this particular potential is only dependent upon R, uh, dependent upon rho, sorry. Here, rho is their radial coordinate. So if you see that uh, here, I'm having plus phi naught, 
and if i go all along and if i go along at my uh, like at the other uh, other side that is the outer center there is a negative charge density inside and obviously here there would be some electric field so electric field would be in the radial direction only so i can expect that my b is dependent only on rho so i'm just writing the rho part and so this is uh, this you can take as as a spherically symmetric case this is a spherically symmetric case that is we do not have, uh, sorry you do not have a azimuth you have an azimuthal symmetry sorry you have an azimuthal symmetry and further you can see that there is no variation along z axis so there is a symmetry uh, about the uh, about z axis so overall this this case in order to solve it i, I can write d by d rho rho dv upon d rho is equals to some constant c1 this will be my some constant c1 and So, like uh, this, no, this would not be some constant. This would be some constant. So, rho dv by d rho would be some constant. So, v will be c1 ln rho plus c2. Sorry. So, v would be c1 ln rho plus c2. Is that clear? Sorry. So, what I wanted to suggest was that this particular thing is 0. It implies that this particular thing, rho dv rho dv upon d rho is a constant that I have written the, in this fashion. And I know that at rho is equals to b. My potential is zero. At rho is equal to b, my potential is zero, which implies that uh, my c two is minus c one ln b. And if I want to find my c one, I would simply take uh, at rho is equals to a, my potential b is phi naught. So I will write phi naught is equals to c one ln a minus c1 ln b so my c1 would be phi naught upon ln of a by b so my c naught will be uh, phi naught upon ln of a by b and if i replace all these things up so i'll get my potential v as i can write it as phi naught uh, upon ln a by b okay why not ln of a by b okay and um, i can write ln rho minus uh, c1 is again phi not ln a by b and then i have ln b overall this is the result so this is my potential as a function of uh, rho so potential as a function of rho you can just take phi not and here you have this ln of a by b here and here you have this ln of rho so this is how you can uh, write this potential as a function of rho so here you can write potential as a function of rho this will be your potential as a function of rho uh, how to find electric field how to find electric field so in order to find the electric field what i would do i would simply take the derivative with respect to rho Derivative here you can take a total derivative also partial not required because uh, since b is only the function of rho only so ln of a by b will come here and here you will have ln of rho upon b and you just take the derivative so if I just take the derivative part this is like phi not upon ln of a by b and uh, this negative you just absorb it here so it will be like b upon a here. Uh, and this derivative will be 1 upon rho upon b. So this will come as b and rho will come here and then 1 upon b because uh, the rho derivative with respect to rho will be 1. 1 over b comes with the chain rule. So this will be. So electric field will be in the, the rho cap direction and this minus I have absorbed. So electric field in general in rho cap direction will, can be written as phi naught upon ln of b upon a and then you have this rho. This is your electric field. So electric field between these two plates would be this. So this is something that we found from our analysis. Is that clear? I think this is quite clear. And uh, as we did in the previous lecture also, that we found the uh, we found the we found that uh, what was that? And we found the capacitance. So here also we are going to find capacitance, but in precisely we are going to find the capacitance per unit length. 
capacitance per unit length. Why we are going to find capacitance per unit length? Because here the length is infinite. So what I would do, I would simply find capacitance per unit length. So I would just find capacitance per unit length. So you are aware that on the inner inner uh, this thing, total charge accumulated we have to find. So instead I'll find sigma. Sigma upon epsilon naught will be some normal component on this particular uh, inner charge, inner cylinder. So on the inner cylinder we can see the total uh, electric field if it exists it exists only in the radial direction. So I can write that uh, sigma would be equals to phi naught. I think uh, an epsilon naught upon uh, rho would be a here so a ln of b upon a. So this will be my sigma. And if the sigma is multiplied with the uh, surface surface area of the cylinder, surface area of the cylinder is what? So I will get my uh, total charge as sigma into surface area. Surface area will be two pi a into l. So what would be surface? Uh, what would be charge? Charge will be sigma into two pi a into l. And if I divide this, l, I'll get charge per unit length. What will be charge per unit length? Charge per unit length, I'll say lambda is equals to what? Is equals to two pi. And then I will have some phi naught. I will have some epsilon naught. Uh, I think I will have some A will get cancelled. And ln of yep. Okay. So this is 2 pi. A gets cancelled. Phi naught, epsilon naught. And then this uh, ln b pi. So overall this is charge point length. If I want to find the capacitance, all I need to do is I will just divide this charge point length divided by total potentials. So I will get capacitance per unit length. So I'll get capacitance per unit length. And capacitance per unit length will be potential difference between the two plates is phi naught. So this will give me 2 pi epsilon naught ln of v pi. So this is the capacity or this is the capacitance uh, per unit length for a, a, for a cylindrical capacitor or for the case of coaxial cable. So here I have uh, finished this particular thing. Uh, I'm finishing this particular lecture. In this particular lecture, we extended the ideas from the previous lecture and uh, we wrote two important qualitative results. These qualitative results are what you, you should remember. This is very important. And at times, this is also referred to as mean value property for potential functions. This is also referred to as mean value property of potential function. We're going to see in greater detail all these things and we'll see that there are, uh, there are questions being asked on this particular problem, this particular thing as well. Okay, so I hope everything is fine. Uh, please let me know if uh, certain things you are not able to follow. Please let me know if there is a scope of improvement. Till then, take care. Shall meet in the next lecture.